You may be seated. Our second scripture lesson comes to us this morning from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Let's, let us listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church this morning. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then... He sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the, the Messiah. May God open our hearts to receive this word to us this morning. Well, today I can open an app on my phone and type in my name and find out all kinds of information about myself. I've also found out, have, have any of the rest of you ever done this? Okay, come on, confess. Yeah, a few of you. Well, it's kind of fun. Um, there's a, uh, I also know that there's another, Anita Hendricks, spelled exactly the same way, who lives in um, eastern Tennessee and sells real estate. So, <laughs> we don't look alike, though. <laughs> but at the time of Jesus, you know, there wasn't Google or Facebook. And Jesus couldn't watch uh, CNN or listen to NPR and find out the latest that people were saying about him. That just didn't happen. So he relied on his personnel committee to garner some feedback about him. Jesus wanted to know what people were saying about him. While this might appear to be an uncharacteristic, self-interested move on his part, Jesus was trying to gauge the effectiveness of his ministry. So he asked his disciples, who do people say that I, am, the Son of Man is? He used the word, the Son of Man. When he asked this question, he and his disciples are in Caesarea Philippi, which is in the northern part of Israel, a city... Um, I guess that would be north, right? <laughs> a city of Greek Roman culture known for its worship of various gods. Perhaps this religiously pluralistic context inspires Jesus to ask this question of his disciples. The question comes in the mid part of the Gospel of Matthew. In Mark's, um, in Mark's rendition of this story, we find uh, Jesus asking, who do people say that I am? And Luke renders the question, who do the crowds say that I am? But in Matthew, Jesus self-refers as the Son of Man, pretty consistently. The phrase Son of Man has two meanings. First, it is used in the Psalms in a poetic way of saying the person is human. And Jesus was always referring to himself, yes, as human. But Jesus uses the definite article, the, so he self-identifies as the Son of Man, a reference to a specific messianic prophecy found in the book of Daniel. By using the title, the Son of Man, Jesus claims his identity as the promised Messiah. The disciples respond to his questions some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Was Jesus disappointed in their answers? I imagine this response might have been somewhat disheartening to Jesus. 
After all the miracles and healings, the casting out of demons, the stilling of storms, the feeding of thousands of people with only a few fish and some loaves of bread, this is what they thought of his identity? Earlier in the chapter, this chapter of Matthew, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had tested Jesus, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He asks another question, seeking Peter's opinion. But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, who so often gets it wrong, gets it right this time. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus rewards him for this response. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. We can imagine that Peter was feeling pretty proud of himself, pretty happy. He got one right. Then Jesus goes on to say, I tell you, Peter, and on this rock, you know, the word Peter means rock, so I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So Peter's identity is changed because of his association with the Christ. The disciples are told to keep the identity of Jesus a secret. To keep it on the down low because Jesus isn't ready to have it revealed to everyone. Earlier in the gospel, the disciples have heard the words Messiah and Son of God, and they've used this, these words in reference to Jesus. But who is Jesus? People in the first century had a difficult time figuring him out. Was he a teacher of wisdom? Was he a social reformer? You know, the way he referred to the lilies of the field or take a lesson from a tree, people might have thought he was a, a nature lover. Often he spoke like a prophet. Jesus was kind of hard to figure out. In his commentary on Matthew, Bishop Tom Wright of the Church of England contrasts the religious leadership of Jesus with that of the Dalai Lama. The belief in the transmigration of souls figures strongly in Buddhism, and so when the Dalai Lama dies, Buddhists believe his soul migrates. And so Tibetan Buddhists will seek to discover the new Dalai Lama among the babies born at a, the exact time that the Dalai Lama dies. The people of Israel had been waiting and waiting a long, long time for the Messiah. There had been a number of Messiah wannabes. No one knew when or exactly where this new king would be born. And as we all know from the Christmas story, it took some uh, Babylonian or Mesopotamian scholars to figure out where that was. The only criteria that everybody was kind of sure about was that he would be a true descendant of the house of David, a true descendant from King David. But there were also scriptures that alluded to a triumphant king who would fulfill prophecy, purge the temple, and bring God's lasting reign of peace and justice. Jesus met the first criteria. He was a descendant of David. But to, the, to this point in the Gospel of Matthew, he had not cleansed the temple, and he had not established God's reign on earth. So Jesus wants to know what people are saying about him. Peter's declaration that Jesus is the promised Messiah reveals Peter's developing faith. Now, while Peter believed Jesus was the Messiah, many others at the time remained unconvinced. 
He had a lot going against him, actually. He just didn't fit the Messiah profile. For example, he was born in unusual circumstances and of questionable parentage, his mother having conceived him before she was married. He was from a poor family, but his birth threatened a king and attracted foreign diplomats. Rather than stay at home and take on the family business as an expected Jewish male, he became a wandering teacher who led a ragtag group of disciples. Rather than take on a wife, which was also expected of a good Jewish man, he remained single. He had no visible means of support, yet he spent a lot of time at parties and provided food for thousands. He performed incredible miracles, but never used his power to benefit himself. He cast out evil spirits, at the same time was blamed for being in league with them. He appeared to be a righteous person, but he hung out with the dregs of society with whom he even ate and drank. People in our time also have varying notions of who Jesus is. According to Barna Research, 92% of Americans believe Jesus was a real person. Only 56% believe he was God. About a quarter of our population think of Jesus as a great teacher like Buddha or Muhammad. Some think him a hoax. 18% check unsure in regard to the divinity of Jesus. Most churches maintain that Jesus is the promised Messiah, God incarnate, come among us to save us and draw us back into relationship with God. However, there are plenty of dedicated Presbyterians who are ambivalent about who Jesus is. While I was serving on a committee on ministry and working with a church that was calling a pastor, I talked with an elder from that congregation who was very high up in leadership in the presbytery. And he commented, it really wouldn't matter to our congregation whether or not the new pastor believed in Jesus. Wow. When people talk about Jesus, are they talking about the same Jesus we believe? Writer Rob Bell wonders, when people use the word Jesus, then it's important for us to ask, who are they talking about? Are they referring to a token tribal membership, a tamed, domesticated Jesus who waves the flag and promotes whatever values they have decided their nation needs to return to? Are they referring to the supposed source of the imperial impulse of their group, which wants to conquer other groups in the name of Jesus? Are they referring to the logo or slogan of their political, economic, or military system through which they sanctify their greed and their lust for power? Or are they referring to the very life source of the universe who has walked among us and continues to sustain everything with his love and power and grace and energy? Who is Jesus for you? This question and its answer impacts our spiritual lives. Is Jesus God made available to us? If we think of him as our savior, what does that mean? What are we being saved for or from? Is Jesus our friend and companion? Is he our sovereign, our Lord, the one who rules our lives? Jesus comes to each one of us differently. And we need one another to understand fully who Jesus is. 
In his letter to the Romans, the, the Apostle Paul appeals to his leaders to appreciate the diversity of the body of Christ and the ways that disciples are differently gifted. And along with our differing gifts, we bring our various understandings of who Jesus is. And as we worship and learn and grow and serve together, we come to know Jesus more fully. Jesus is among us through the power of the Holy Spirit, knitting us together, all our individual gifts and problems through joy and sorrow, tears and laughter. Together, we share Christ with the world. And when we become members of the Presbyterian Church, we answer questions. We were talking about this in the confirmation class this morning. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Will you be his faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? When we join the church, we say yes to who Jesus is. What does it mean that Jesus is Lord? The word Lord has less meaning for us than it did in prior times before democracy. We don't like we don't live in a feudal society where lords of, of castles rule their subjects. And we Americans have a strong negative reaction to tyranny, to lording it over anyone. So the archaic language of the Bible is unfamiliar and perhaps that is one of the reasons people are less attracted to Jesus than in previous generations. We Americans don't want someone lording it over us. And so, perhaps it is difficult for us to submit to the sovereignty of Jesus, the yoke of discipleship. It's a daily choice. Jesus living among people demonstrated what it means to be close to God, to dwell in the presence of God. He took time apart to pray. He lived among people. He didn't shrink from those in need of healing, food, freedom, hope. Jesus' sovereignty was demonstrated in his service and in his laying down his life for those he loved. Peter and the other disciples would learn who Jesus was as they followed him, as they witnessed him healing people and confronting people, as they watched him die and they greeted his resurrection, as they were empowered by the Holy Spirit to preach and teach and grow the church. So who do you say Jesus is? A great teacher, a prophet, a miracle worker? Do we join with Peter in saying, you, Jesus, are the Messiah, the fulfillment of God's promise to save us from our worst selves? Our allegiance to Christ shapes all that we are all that we do. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.